everyone and welcome to the Daily Boffin Bulletin for Tuesday the 17th of April 2018. I'm Lucy aka World War II Boffin. Uh, to start our bulletin we have our On This Day in World War II section. So 17th of April 1941, Yugoslavia formally surrenders to the Axis. The German submarine U-566 was commissioned. A Type 7C, the workhorse of the German U-boat force, uh, with a displacement of 769 tonnes when surfaced and 871 tonnes when submerged, with speeds reaching 17.7 knots uh, when surfaced and 7.6 knots when submerged, with a crush depth of between 250 and 295 metres, she would eventually be scuttled by her crew on the 24th of October 1943 after being damaged by six depth charges uh, from a British Wellington aircraft in the North Atlantic uh, west of Portugal. There were, however, no casualties. Uh, also in 1941 on this day, one of the heaviest German bombing attacks since the war began is made on London, uh, commencing just after 9pm on the evening of the 16th of April and lasting until almost dawn on the 17th. 66 boroughs were affected, uh, with the main bombing being on central and southern London. Public buildings that were damaged included St Paul's Cathedral and the Houses of Parliament, and serious fires were caused at Selfridges and the Kidbrook RAF stores depot. Uh, many of the fires, fires were still burning at daybreak, but the situation the authorities said uh, was in hand. Uh, in 1942, on this day, Japanese forces in Burma reached Ying Yang Yong, and I'm hoping that I have pronounced that right, uh, and retreating Allied forces destroyed the main oil fields in Burma to prevent them from falling into Japanese hands. Also in 1942 on this day, uh, Bomber Command carries out a low-level daylight raid deep into occupied Europe to attack the Mann diesel factory in Augsburg, um, southern Germany, and they were producers of U-boat engines. It was an experimental raid designed to utilise the range and bomb load of the Lancaster, which was only now just becoming operational. And it was hoped that a daylight raid would enable accurate bombing um, whilst low level flight would mean that they would be undetected by radar and hopefully achieve surprise. It almost worked, uh, however, German fighters returning to base after intercepting an RAF diversionary attack uh, spotted the Lancasters and seven out of 12 aircraft were shot down. But the bombing had been accurate, although not all the delayed action bombs exploded, so the damage to the man factory was not as serious as was first thought. On this day in 1943, 117 B-17 bombers from the US 8th Army Air Force uh, raids Bremen in northwest Germany. Also in 1943, on the 17th of April, at a meeting in Salzburg in Austria with Hitler and Joachim von Ribbentrop, Admiral, Mik Admiral Miklos Horthy the region and head of state for the Kingdom of Hungary refuses a personal request by Germany to deliver 800,000 Hungarian Jews to the Nazis, despite the alliance between the two countries. Uh, in 1944, on the 17th of April, the Battle of Central Henan uh, begins between Chinese and Japanese forces in China. And finally, for on this day, in 1945, the Battle of the Hongarai River involving Australian, New Zealand and Japanese forces begins and during the Battle of Nuremberg between US and German forces the Oberkommando der Wehrmacht, the High Command of the German Armed Forces uh, gives the order to defend Nuremberg to the last round uh, and that concludes the On This Day in World War II section for the bulletin. Moving on uh, on to other items, I've chosen a document from the American Archives uh, to share with you today in relation to the Katyen Massacre, which took place in 1940. Uh, the Katyen Massacre was a ser series of mass executions of Polish nationals carried out, it turned out, uh, by the NKVD, which was the Soviet secret police, uh, police force, uh, and they were carried out in April and May 1940. Uh, it was so named the Kat Yen Massacre because many of the victims were buried in mass graves uh, which were eventually found in the Kat Yen Forest in Smolensk. For many, many years this was deemed to have been a Nazi crime.
crime. Um, it was not until many decades later that it would eventually be discovered that this was one crime, that well, one of very few crimes that could not actually be laid at the door of the Nazis. Uh, so this document that is in the American archives in connection to the Cashier Massacre is a witness statement which was made by a German by the name of Axel de Veriz. Uh, now he made this statement to the American Consulate General in January 1952 uh, stating his belief that this had not actually been a German crime and that it was in fact Russian. Now in 1952 uh, I sincerely doubt very many if anybody would have believed him when he accused uh, it being a Russian crime and not one committed by the Nazis. So, uh, so I'm just going to read this uh, very quickly to you. Uh, so, uh, Axel de Veres was, uh, bear me a second, he was the Deputy National Chairman of the German Baltic Association and a member of the Executive Committee of the United East German Associations. Uh, he was interviewed by an officer of the American Consulate General, and this was the statement that he gave. I declare as follows. In 1943, I belonged to the military administration with the rank of major uh, of a special agrarian staff under the economic, economic Inspection Office of the German Wehrmacht. The task of this special staff was to effect the agrarian reform in Russia after the breakdown of the Kolkhoz regime for the purpose of establishing a free and independent farmer class. The headquarters of the special staff were at Smolensk. It was in close cooperation with the staff of the Herzgrupp Mitte, the middle group of the German army between the uh, northern and southern groups, under the command of Field Marshal General von Kluge. After the, after the discovery of the graves at Kachien, Frau Erhardt, an interpreter from my office, whose mother was a Pole and who had a very good knowledge of the Polish language, was assigned to the investigating committee. Due to this circumstance and to the fact that I have a complete mastery of the Russian language and know Russia well, I was able to obtain full information about the investigations. Also, I was called upon several times to take part in inspections, as for instance during the visit of the International Red Cross delegation. At, their time, at that time, there was a propaganda section of the Supreme Command of the Wehrmacht under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Kost, who owned an estate in Westphalia. That section was very well informed about the whole case. Statements on that part of the case could be made by Dr. N. von Grotter, who is now managing, direct, managing editor sorry, of the Dusseldorf Zeitung of Dusseldorf. At the time above referred to, at the time above referred to, Dr. Von Grotter was a captain in the propaganda section of the OKW, Supreme Command of the Wehrmacht, in Berlin. Personally, I can swear to the following: the situation of the graves, the method of burying the bodies, and the way the murders were committed, etc. Uh, just a quick side note: uh, de, sorry, the various uh, included a sketch in his statement of the location of. Uh, the graves and the bodies and this will be floating across your screen uh, very soon as I continue with the statement. As shown by the attached sketch the graves lay near the railway line from Smolensk opening onto the Smolensk Moscow Highway. They were, mass, they were mass graves in which were the bodies of persons who had been killed by shots in the back of the neck. They lay in rows in various layers. During the inspection of the forest in which the graves had been dug, I noticed that on the southern side of the woodland road near the graves, the forest showed greatly differing degrees of density. This is often the case in Russia, but at that place it was noticeable to such a great extent that minor open spaces were distinctly visible. As there used to be a GPU building at the edge of this forest, near the bank of the, the Dnipia and the local population spoke about shooting and executions having taken place near that building, Excavation was started at the above described, described spots. It proved to be an area in which ever since the Russian Civil Wars sorry, it proved to be an area in which ever since the Russian Civil Wars those murdered by the GPU had been buried. A great number of skeletons were exhumed. In several cases before those persons had been murdered, their arms had been bound together behind their backs with thick wire. 
Among others, the remains of the garments of two clergymen were found in these graves, which had been preserved in the sterile sand in which the bodies had been buried. The facts mentioned by me, as far as I know, not specified in the reports by the International Red Cross Commission. However, the above mentioned details are, in my opinion, important as they incontestably prove that the wood in which the mass graves of the murdered Polish officers lay was a place which had been used for decades by the Bolshevists, the burial of those they had murdered. On the occasion of my frequent visits to the office of the investigating committee, I was able to examine a great number of papers and documents found with the corpses. These were identity certificates, diaries, entries in notebooks, etc. I remember exactly that all those personal writings ended on one and the same day of 1940. If I am not mistaken, it was on one day in May or June 1940. Many of the writings contain sketches of the route taken by the prisoners chiefly in two large groups, up to the neighbourhood of Kashyam. The lady interpreter mentioned by me above, but whose address I unfortunately do not know, has exact knowledge of the details. I am prepared to swear to my statements. Okay, yours respectfully, Axel de Beres, ends his statement. It wouldn't be until November 2010 that Russia would finally admit that the Kashyam massacre uh, had been uh, ordered by the Soviet uh, Union. So for many years it had been classified as a Nazi war crime and when it was actually in fact a Soviet war crime. Uh, and that's that section of other news all completed. Uh, Reader's Corner for you, just a little bit of uh, info from here as well. Uh, I'm going to return to the Bringing History to Life magazine which I introduced in the blog yesterday. Uh, another very interesting article that I have found in this magazine uh, is in relation to the Gestapo and how they were helped by ordinary German civilians to carry out their tasks. Um, the Gestapo had to monitor somewhere in the region of 66 million Germans. Uh, their numbers were only in, in the region of a few thousand, so in order to help them to carry out their tasks uh, so effectively, uh, they relied on civilian informants and this is what this article in uh, the Bringing History to Life magazine uh, is all about. So snitches help the Gestapo and the photo that you can see just there is of the Gestapo in Berlin just after Hitler's takeover in 1933 raiding the Communist Party headquarters there. And I'm just going to read you a couple of extracts from the article which I found to be of particular interest. Uh, so this is the introduction uh, to the article. Helen Stuffel placed her ear against the wall and strained her senses to find out what her neighbour was up to in the apartment next door. On many nights, the female tailor would sit and listen to the wall next to Peter Holdenberg's third floor apartment in the city of Essen. As with previous nights, Stuffel was sure she could hear voices from enemy radio stations, the BBC and Radio Moscow. The tailor was convinced that 64-year-old Holdenberg tuned into the forbidden frequencies to listen between 21.45 and midnight each evening. But to confirm her suspicions, she invited two other women from next door to listen in. Her guests agreed. Peter Holdenberg was listening to radio stations banned by Hitler. The following morning, Stuffel headed down, headed down to the local branch of the Nazi party, uh, which quickly notified the Gestapo. Holdenberg is a scaremonger, she told them in a statement. She also accused him of being pro-Jewish, having allegedly heard him complain about not being able to buy items on credit after Jewish shops were closed down. Another neighbour claimed to have heard Holdenberg speak favourably of the Soviet Union. He is very dangerous for the government, Stoffel concluded before she returned to her apartment. On the 10th of December 1941, around a week later, the third floor hallway suddenly filled with the sound of stomping boots. That stomp, that stoops, that stopped outside the front door with the nameplate Holdenberg. A hard and insistent knocking followed, but time passed before the invalided resident was able to open the door. Gestapo was the officer's introduction before the men ominously informed Holdenberg that he had been arrested on suspicion of anti-Nazi behaviour. Uh, another section of the article uh, that I'm going to quote. This is in relation to uh, one of the main targets of the Gestapo, uh, the communists. Uh, and this is in relation to 24 communist leaders uh, who were arrested by uh, the Gestapo and ultimately died uh, during an interrogation or after they were sent 
to the concentration camps uh, by the Gestapo. One of the victims mentioned here is 53-year-old Gotthilf Schlotterbeck, who perished in Dachau. Uh, communist families also suffered from their connection to the party. Gotthilf's son Friedrich, Friedrich recalls such treatment in 1945. The Gestapo also, also took away my brother Hermann for distributing communist leaflets. Ill treatment by the SS consisted of beating him up, throwing him to the ground and crushing his bones by treading on him. After a few weeks they let him go, but his internal injuries were so severe that he was a hopeless cripple. He was only 14 years old. The Gestapo's brutal treatment of political enemies and their families was a del deliberate tactic to suppress dissent and dissuade other Germans from involving themselves in politics outside of the Nazi party. The police force frequently called in children and young people who'd been associated with communist or SPD, social democratic parties, to remind them that Nazism was the only way forward. Its regular checks also took in Friedrich, Friedrich Schlotterbeck's disabled little brother Hermann. The Gestapo intended that he should not recover and they made sure of that by never letting him alone. Every time he paid his compulsory visit to their headquarters for social welfare, welfare education, they beat him up all over again, wrote Friedrich, the only one of five members of his family to survive the war. Further along in the article, it's a good couple of pages long, so very, very detailed, very informative, you have got a diagram there, illustration slash diagram, uh, given the layout of the Gestapo headquarters. Uh, so you've got the entrance just down here. This is at the infamous address, the Prinz Albrecht Strasse. Uh, so the entrance just here. These were the isolation, isolation cells, uh, 39 in all. Along here you have got the interrogation rooms uh, where many of the Gestapo's victims were tortured and you've also got the offices of Himmler and Heydrich uh, mixed in there as well. In connection to the torture element for which the Gestapo are notorious uh, there is also an item in the article here that I'm going to use as an example for you as well as just as an example of the methods that were used by the Gestapo. Uh, just to pre-warn you in advance uh, this is not very pleasant, um, so you may find it a little bit distressing on the gruesome side, uh, at least. So just to give you a bit of a pre-warning there. Gestapo methods vary depending on the crime the prisoners were charged with. When the case didn't involve an enemy of the state who'd actively tried to undermine Nazism, then blows from fists or weapons were rarely implemented. The charges against uh, Holdenberg fell into this category. On the other hand, beatings and torture were a major component of Gestapo interrogation methods when officers in the SS questioned political enemies, unionists and members of small opposition organisations. Basically people who could give up the anti-Nazi plans and activities of other Germans. Sometimes officers would shackle a prisoner's hands behind his back, place a hook in the handcuffs and hoist the victim up and down to dislocate his arms. In addition, torturers could also administer electric shocks through electro electrodes uh, placed, in the hand, placed on the hands, feet and ears. If the prisoner still refused to speak, the Gestapo could put electrode electrodes up the anus on the tip of the prisoner's penis. Waterboarding and crushing of testicles and fingers were also part of the Gestapo's repertoire. Officers were also able to open windows in the interrogation rooms so the screams of torture victims rang out in the prison yard to deter new prisoners. Uh, the article concludes by stating that not the Allies didn't punish many Gestapo agents uh, for the organisation's atrocities in Nazi Germany after the war, uh, mainly because the system of the Gestapo uh, was so complex it was very difficult to determine which agents had been involved uh, in, in, in torture and murder of inmates. So the vast majority of the agents of the Gestapo uh, ultimately really got away with it, which is, uh, needless to say, extremely tragic uh, for all the victims uh, who, were, who fell into the hands of the Gestapo. As I say, so that bringing history to life magazine has turned out to be a, a very good buy. So if you can still find that copy anywhere, I would highly recommend it to you. 
uh, if you can't get hold of it anymore, then I will keep a lookout for uh, further issues. I've ordered uh, the next one, so I'd be interested to see uh, what articles that one contains. Finally, for today's Daily Boffin Bulletin, I'm going to do show and tell again. Uh, this is going to be more of a tell than a show. Uh, this is a rough translation of part of a letter that I have got in my uh, collection of World War II artefacts. It's from a German soldier who was deployed to the Eastern Front uh, during the war and he wrote it to the parents of a comrade who had been killed in action and he wrote it in response to their request to him to know more about how their son had died. Uh, the letter is dated the 28th of February 1942 and the son in question had been killed in December 1941. So, Russia, 28th of February 1942. Family Schneider. Ever since our incorporation into the Schutz Regiment in the autumn of 1940, I have been in the company of your son. At the beginning of the Russian campaign, he had ordered me to be his constant companion, so I was at his side in all easy and difficult engagements. In spite of the difference in rank, we joined in a heartfelt co comradeship. Now, when I tell you in simple terms the process before his death, I hope that this will not aggravate your pain again, and only on your express request I decided on this letter. It was the early morning hours of the 21st of December when our units in the area of Rokowskogi occupied a defensive position. Your son was a forward observer of our battery in a rifle company. He was assigned two wireless operators and my humble self. It may have been about 8 o'clock in the morning when your son set out with me and one of the two wireless operators to visit an observation post on the edge of the forest ahead of us and shoot at the enemy lines ahead of us and shoot at the enemy lines with the battery. Already during our approach, the enemy occupied our section with a fierce blaze that often forced us to take cover. After half an hour's walk, we had reached our intended spot unscathed and began to observe. After five minutes, your son called to the soldier on the wireless and the fire command on the phone, the fire command for the battery. Sorry. After five minutes, your son called to the soldier on the wireless, the fire command for the battery. Since the enemy fire had not yet subsided, he ordered me to provide a pickaxe from an MG operator 20 metres away in order to then eject a, project, a protective cover hole for three of us. I was already on my way back to him when the unbelievable happened. An infernally approaching projectile from an enemy heavy grenade launcher struck, clo struck close to your son. Only a few feet away from him, lying flat on the ground, I took from his cry that something had happened to him. Immediately, immediately I hurried to his aid and found that he had been hit several times by the bullet fragments in both thighs, the abdomen and lungs. While I called out to the message man to bring him help from the rear, I immediately applied emergency bandages to your son's wounds with the available field bandages. Although, although the heavy bleeding had already subsided. Your son was still fully conscious and endured his wounding completely calm and composed. As I awaited the comrades who came to help, we talked about his condition and the current situation. The intense battle noise and the intense cold let minutes and hours pass, but finally came the long-awaited help, among them a medical orderly, who found the applied emergency dressings to be good. In the absence of a stretcher, we placed your son on a tarpaulin and covered him with coats and blankets. So we start the way back through the rough, snow-covered forest. I was constantly trying to prevent your son from falling asleep by talking to him, which was successful. So we start, which was successful, sorry. However, as a result of unfavourable weather conditions and the arduous transport, he was soon seized with, soon seized with great fatigue and our constant attempts to keep him at his senses were unsuccessful. In addition, his pain seemed to increase. We recognised the seriousness of his situation and asked him if we could do something special for him, to which he answered with only a faint moan. It was terrible for all of us to have to stand there without being able to help. After that, your son fell quietly asleep. We then carried him to the relevant company headquarters. The company commander had already transmitted the painful message to our commander, who immediately sent a motor vehicle forward which brought us back to the regiment with your late son. If you continue to have concerns, I am always at your disposal. With the request to confirm the receipt of my letter, I send my regards. 
so that's it for today's bulletin uh, I hope you found the content uh, of interest and I hope you will tune in to tomorrow's bulletin uh, as always if you haven't already do check out the Facebook page www.facebook.com forward slash www2boffin uh, and hope to see you next time until then bye bye